So today I'm going to talk about oneness. And uh, it might not be what you maybe heard before, but praise the Lord. God is revealing better things today, hallelujah, than what we had in the past and, uh, and is helping us with those areas. But just so I can let you know, I have a book that I wrote. This is my second book that I wrote. Uh, this book is about praying for our children. Uh, and I wrote this book uh, because one day God spoke to me and he said, for the next 90 days, I want you to pray a prayer prophetically for our children. So for 90 days on Facebook Live, I prayed for our kids that God will touch our children. Hallelujah. So you have 90 prayers in here to help you pray for your children. Some of it is, is, is binding and rebuking. Some of it is, is just uh, uh, prayers of, of, of discernment of what's going on with our children, to pray accurately over our children at that moment. And uh, this book would help you with your children. It's, it's $20 in the back, but I always tell people, if you don't have the money, you're a mom, you got kids, uh, just go get it. Hallelujah. Amen. I want you to know how to pray for your children. Somebody say pray for your children. Pray, parents ought to be praying for their children every day. I mean, every, your kids need your prayers every single day. And, and you're my age and you're like me. I got 14 grandchildren. Hallelujah. Amen. So I thought my kids kept me in prayer. My grandchildren really keep me in prayer. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, all my kids are grown and and my oldest daughter is 47 years old, but they're still my babies, hallelujah, amen. And I still pray over them every day, and I still lift them up to Jesus every day. And uh, I'll tell you, uh, parents that pray for their kids uh, do more for them in your prayer than trying to slam them upside the head with the Bible all the time. Uh, <laughs> could I get a good amen? Uh, there's two ways to best win your kids, and that's through prayer, and that's by example. You can't slam your kids with the Bible, and then you're talking all ugly at home, hate everybody, gossiping about everybody, being ugly at home, always leaving from one church to the next church because the last church did you wrong, so now you're going to the next church. we we, we, we got to stop all that nonsense because you cause your children not to want to come to church and not to want to serve God. So the best two things you could do for your children is pray for them and be the example. Be the example of love. You know, love them, love on them. And, yes, there's times where you have to sit down and have some straight talk with your kids and uh, tell them truths and teach them uh, uh, principles of, of what's going to help them to have success in life and teach them right from wrong and teach them morals and teach them, you know, the things of, of Scripture. But the best thing you could do is teach them by your living. I don't think nobody heard me today. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody say the best thing we could do is teach them by how? By how? You're living. Do they see you live at home the way you act at church? Always praising God at church, and then you go home screaming and yelling at everybody. Even the dogs are afraid of you. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, 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 we we, we got we to gotta be more anointed at home than we try to be anointed at church. Somebody say amen. amen. I even pray over my dogs. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> they need prayer. Trust me. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Uh, I pray over my dogs. I have talks with my dogs. Hallelujah. We, we have walks together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And if we do that for our dogs, how much more should we do that for our children? Our children today need a lot of our time, a lot of our attention. Our children need us to spend quality time with them and uh, not just to give them spiritual things, but just to give them your heart and give them your love, that, that you care. They need to see that you are concerned about their life and what they're going through and what they're dealing with because our kids are dealing with a lot of stuff today, the temptations, the, the stuff that's after their mindsets and, and ways, the stuff that's trying to change their way of believing, uh, the st and then their own temptations that they're going on inside of them, you know, their own flesh that is rising up on the inside of them. And we got we got we got to spend some time 
really being serious about our kids. Could I get a good amen? amen? One thing you can't do in leading your kids, you can't lead them with guilt. I didn't hear anybody say amen, hallelujah, amen. Is it okay if I take off this jacket? I wanted to look good when I came in, hallelujah, amen. But, but now we'll get into the meat of it, hallelujah, amen. Praise God. So somebody say you can't lead by guilt. And as leaders, we can't lead by guilt either in the church. Many churches lead by guilt, and when they lead in guilt, they put stuff on the people instead of taking stuff off the people. When you lead your kids out of guilt, you put stuff on them instead of taking stuff off them. I don't think anybody got that. Hallelujah. Amen. I said you put stuff on them. You put your stuff on them. When you leave guilt, you put what you have on you on them. Hmm? But when you teach and minister to your kids out of your freedom, out of your liberty, out of your, out of your love for God, then you put that on them. And we're putting all the wrong stuff on our kids. Hello. So I've been doing this for a long, long time. And I've seen a lot of parents do the same thing I've done on our kids. And we put on them what's on us that we haven't settled with God yet. And we put it on them. And we can't do that. I, I don't talk to my kids out of guilt. I don't talk to my kids out of condemnation. I don't talk to my kids because I'm trying to get them to be spiritual. I don't talk to my kids because I want them to, to abide by every scripture. I talk to my kids from my heart and with my love. Hallelujah. And then they open up and want to start knowing the principles of God. Hallelujah. Amen. We got to get our kids to open up. But most of our kids are close to us. They don't want to hear what we have to say. Because you've been putting all the wrong stuff on them. We think we want to hear anything you're going to say. They say, oh, Mama, Dad, I don't want what you have. The serving Jesus is all about what I see in you. Forget it. I need to make sure that what I am uh, uh, getting myself into, it's making you happy. It's making you joyful. It's making you peaceful. It's making you free. I don't want stuff that's making me all bound and ugly and mad at the whole world like it is with you. Always complaining, always whining, always griping, always mad at your husband, mad at your wife, mad at everything, hallelujah. Always talking about the pastor, talking about the sisters, talking about the brothers, hallelujah. Talking about what you don't like, didn't like, hallelujah. Instead of talking about the good things of the Lord, hallelujah, amen. Uh, we can't get into oneness with our children if we're not in oneness with God, you can't be one with God if you're living your life out of guilt. You're living your life out of hurts and wounds and offenses and anger and what mom and dad did to you. If you're still complaining about what mom and dad did to you, you're putting that same thing on your kids. Because guess what they're going to talk next? What you did to them. You got to get over what mom and dad did or didn't do for you. Hallelujah. Amen. And how do you do that? I forgive them. I'm going to now be a son like I should have been to my parents. Hallelujah. And honor them and respect them and love them. Guess what? When my kids see me honor my parents, guess what they want to do? Honor me. Hallelujah. Amen. But when they don't see you honor your parents, somebody say honor your parents. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Man, isn't that what the Bible tells us to do? But we have adult children that don't honor their parents. Talk to them ugly and disrespectful. We have church members that don't talk to their spiritual leaders with respect and honor. Could I get a Shandai Hikamo? Hallelujah. Amen. Everybody say oneness. There's nothing going to happen spiritually until there's a oneness. Until there's a oneness. I'll give you an example. Services move better when everybody in the church is in oneness. Somebody say oneness. oneness. Hallelujah. 
if when we have a service and one person's on their phone all the time, another person's on their camera, another person is searching Facebook, another person is talking in the back, another person is doing this. Some people are trying to get out of service by being in the back area, hallelujah, because they don't want to hear. All that stuff happens, glory to God. We ain't one. We're all over the place. I make it a requirement in my church, 15 minutes before service, what you had to get done better be done already. And if you're a leader or a helper in my church, you don't get to church when church starts. You get there a half hour, an hour before. Why? Because once I start that service, we're going to respect and reverence the Lord in one mind and one accord together. Hallelujah. I don't want nobody walking around, talking around, playing games, trying to get away from worship. I heard somebody say, I wish so-and-so was here right now. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, <laughs> send them the recording. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, <laughs> don't do your business during service. You draw attention to yourself. Everybody's watching you. I watch when people are doing stuff during service, and everybody's eyes are going on what people are doing. And they're not focused on where the anointing is starting to move. And I don't care. You just don't focus when the preacher gets up there. You focus the moment somebody stands up and say, it's time to begin. Hallelujah. Amen. And everyone's focus should be on what God is doing from that moment through the praise, through the worship, through the testimony, through the giving, through the offering. Hallelujah. We should all be in one accord. Hallelujah. Amen. If we would go to work the way we go to church, we'd all be fired sometimes. <laughs> Going to church, oh, excuse me, boss, but I'm working on my camera, I'm working on my phone, I'm working on this. I'll get to my work in just a minute. Hallelujah. Amen. No, we don't, we don't do stuff like that. The less attention on you, the more you free people up to give the attention where it belongs, and that's God. What God's doing through the person that he's using at the moment. If we don't know how to enter into oneness in a service, we'll never enter into oneness as a family. You got to come into oneness. See, people say, you know, uh, you say you want order, and that's a little too hard for me. I said, if I can't get you to get into a service in order, I'm never going to get you to get in order with the things of God. And, and please, I'm not talking about nobody. I'm not thinking about nobody. I don't have nobody on my mind. I'm preaching from a father's heart to you this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. So right away, people say, oh, he must be talking about so-and-so. No, I'm not. Oh, he must be thinking about so-and-so. He's the eye. No, no, no. I I'm trying to get us to get into oneness because there's something that happens when the people are one. Hallelujah. Amen. There's an anointing that flows. There's a glory that manifests. There's a transformation that takes place. There's a maturing that takes place when you are giving yourself totally to the word that's going forth instead of your mind on this person moving over there and that person giving coffee back there and that person over here trying to fiddle with the, with the, with the speakers and this person fiddling with the drums and that person over there uh, looking at everybody coming in 50, 20 minutes late, hallelujah, and everybody's all over the place. We don't know how to be a time to church. Man, we, we're on time to work. And I'm not getting on nobody today because I don't know your reason for being late today. But I'm just talking. Hallelujah. Amen. I tell my ushers, stop moving around. You create more commotion than everybody else. Your usher work, you should be at your post, not walking around. That means you got everything done already. And when the service is going forward, we're not looking at who's coming in, who's going out, what that sister's doing, what that brother. We pay attention 
to the word of God. We pay attention to what God is saying and what God is doing. We all enter in in one accord. Hallelujah. Amen. And I'm telling you, if you want services that is going to blow this roof off, hallelujah, if you want service that's going to have the, the radiance of God's glory, his Shekinah glory flowing, you enter into oneness and find out what God will do. I'll tell you, people will start dropping at their seats, hallelujah, amen, because of the presence of God that's in the room, because we're all in one accord from the front to the back, hallelujah. Everybody is walking together in one mind and one accord there's no moving around. There's, there's reverence. There's no reverence in the church today. We treat it like a routine. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 with me, if you will. Hallelujah. Company. Oneness, unity, multiplication, power, increase, accountability, relationships, advancement, provisions, graces, all happen when oneness begins to manifest among us. The best thing a husband and wife could do to, to prosper as a family is be one. The best thing the leaders could do to grow their house, sometimes we, we focus on all the elements in the house, what I've done is I first focus on my leaders. If I can't get my leaders on time, if I can't get my leaders to be still during the service, if I can't get my leaders to focus on the word of God, if I can't get my leaders to stop being busy in the service and get focused on the service, then I'm not going to get nobody else to do it. I start with my leaders. I hold them accountable. And I always lose a few during the process, but that's okay. Because I'm after something greater than them. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, amen. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. With all lowliness, meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. For there is one body, one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. There's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Hallelujah. Amen. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, this passage of Scripture, I could preach on for days because there's so much in it. But the whole purpose of this passage of Scripture comes before God talks about the fivefold gifts and ministering and equipping the saints. Hallelujah. So God is saying, even before the gifts are established, the fivefold, you got to get people to know how to come into oneness. You got to get people how to come into one accord. How do you get people to come into one vision instead of many visions? And, and, and leaders have a problem in getting people focused on the vision of the church. And the leaders of the church sometimes have focus on focusing on what the vision is because they got their own visions. Well, I think we should do this. Well, we didn't ask you. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, if we wanted to know what you wanted to do, we would have asked you. Wait your time. There will be a time for that. But now's not the time. Right now it's time to be still or shut up and listen. Hallelujah. And go with the flow and just stay in oneness. Stay in what's already going. Stay with what God has already established. Stay with what God's already laid down. And go with the flow and stop trying to add your own sense to everything. I told you I was going to talk to you like a father. Hallelujah. Amen. Am I okay, Apostle Diane? Hallelujah. What is the key to a healthy church? If you want to mess up a church, take it out of its oneness. 
many opinions, many visions, many complaints, discord, and strife, and division, and schisms. Always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And there's no oneness. There's no power. It's routine. It's religion. You know what identifies God? His oneness. With the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost are one. And his oneness, hallelujah, is what demonstrates the image of what Christ wants us to begin to bear fruit of is a oneness. As a father, I've learned to do more listening than I've done talking. Sometimes people get around me, they want me to talk. I said, no, I'm listening. I'm listening to you, how you talk. I could always tell as a father, get around people, what's going on with them by just listening to what they say, what they ask, what comments they make, how they relate to people, what they're thinking. Why? So I could father them. So I could undo some garbage that's been put inside of them. Some wrong thinking. So I listen. Before? I was trying to straighten everybody out the moment I meet them. Oh, this is what God says. Hallelujah. Amen. No, I listen as a father. And I discern. So that sons will get free and grow up. But I talk to them from a father's heart of love. Not a father's heart of condemnation and putting guilt on people. I don't want to put guilt on nobody. I want to bring change to people. Somebody say change. Hallelujah. Amen. So we are supposed to be one. One in heart. One in talk. One in prayer. One in serving. Now let me talk to you about serving for a minute. Because everybody thinks, well, this is my place of serving, so I'm going to serve it my way. No. You're going to serve it the way the leader wants it to be served. <sighs> well, I think we should do it this way. Well, that's great. But God didn't call you to be the leader of the house. Hallelujah. Amen. God called you to serve the leader of the house. And if you think she's wrong or he's wrong, glory to God, then just pray for them. But shut your mouth. Somebody say shut it dot com. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, <laughs> and you know, people always look for people who will listen to them. Have you ever been around people and, and they're looking for people that will listen to them? And it's always those real spiritual ones that think they got a better way of helping them than you do. Look at I've been dealing with this knucklehead for five years already, hallelujah. And all of a sudden, you come into the picture, and you're going to deal with them better. No. It's not the way it works. Everything has to be in order. Everything has to be the Father's way, not our way. And I just want to tell you, knowing Apostle Diana, as long as I've known her, you got a great woman of God here. Yeah. And I don't just say that just to say that. I, I know great people of God when I come in connection with them. I know when they have the heart of the Father, and she does. She's willing to change. She's willing to to adjust. She's willing to be a better leader. She's willing to learn from others. You don't find that in leaders very much. And because of that, she'll be better than you'll be better. Are you still here with me? John 17, 21 says that they may be one as thou father art in me 
and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Hallelujah. Amen. Oneness gives a revelation that God is the one that has sent us. God is the one that put this church together. God is the one that raised up this ministry. God is the one that gave you the, the orders. Hallelujah. And when people see oneness, they know you are of God. When they see gossip and strife and division and backbiting and leadership that are fighting against one another and dislike one another and competition with one another and jealous of one another and fighting over which people are going to follow them and which people are going to follow them, all that stuff never works in the house of God. <sighs> Paul talks about it in Corinthians. He says, you're still babies. You're still carnal because one says I'm a Paul and another one says I'm a Paulus. <laughs> Paul says you forget one plants and one waters. When everyone just does their part, it all works out. Hallelujah. Amen. So stop trying to get people to do parts that they've never been given. That's where the trouble comes. To be one... There must be a yielding spirit. You must be able to yield. Somebody say yield. yield. You must give the right away. <laughs> if you can't be a yielding person, you can't be a submissive person. You have to yield to the leadership. You may not even completely agree at the time. You may not even see what she may see right now. And you may not understand. But you yield yourself because you respect the position. You respect the gift. You respect the assignment of God on their life. So you yield yourself. Somebody say, yield yourself. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, people that can't yield are always causing problems. When we don't yield, we have crashes. We have wrecks because we didn't yield. Are you still here with me? Look at somebody and say, yield yourself. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, but, there's that big but getting in the way all the time. Hallelujah. Amen. But, 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 you don't understand. No, you don't understand. You got to operate in oneness. You got to operate in the order that God requires you to operate in. And apostle, what I do, if people don't come into oneness and they continue not to yield, I just sit them down and say, "You don't have no authority here no more." Until you can learn to yield. Because if you don't, you're teaching the rest of the congregation to act like they act. There's no yielding, and we must yield. Now, this is hard when new people come in, because out of every 10 new people come in, I keep two and lose eight. You know why? Because they want to come in and run things the way they ran things over there in the other place. I said, uh-uh, we don't do stuff like you did over there here, hallelujah, amen. I've worked 45 years to build what I've built up to now, and you think I'm going to let some knucklehead that thinks they know everything, haven't built nothing, haven't established nothing, come and tell me how I'm going to build? She's already given six years of her life to get this thing up to where it's at. You think we're going to let one person come in here and say, well, I don't do it that way. Sit down. Uh. Sit down. And then some of you don't have no problem with the apostle, but you have a problem with the people that she assigns. Oh, oh, oh Jesus. Somebody say, oh, no. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, why did he pick her? I had somebody tell me one time, why did you pick her? Do you like her? I said, you lying devil. Get out of here. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I picked her because she yields to the authority, and you don't. 
you have more gifting and grace than she does, but I'm looking more for the character than I'm looking for the grace and the gift. Uh. Well, she can't preach like I could preach. Yeah, we know. But you don't live the way she lives. I could count on her. If I call her, she'll say, yes, what time do you want me to be there? I call and you say, well, let me see what I can do. <laughs> Come on, let's just let that settle in a little bit. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, you say, oh, you're mentally. No, I'm fathering. Mm -mm. I'm fathering. Mm. Somebody say Yield. And I also tell people, if you can't yield to the authority here, then you don't belong here. You need to go find a church you could yield to because you're the one that's going to be hurt and never grow and never mature. And I want you to grow and mature. So if you can't receive me because we have a, 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 a conflict, maybe you don't like my personality, maybe you don't like the way I present myself, maybe you don't like the way I teach, that's okay. Not everybody's going to like me. My feelings are not hurt. Go somewhere else that you can receive from. Uh, you start your own church. Uh, I wouldn't advise them to do that. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I would advise them to go sit somewhere for a while until they can yield themselves and grow in character, hallelujah, and be what God wants them to be. Could I get a good amen, hallelujah, amen. Come on, one more time, say yield yourself, hallelujah, amen. Next, number two, is connect with the vision. Connect with the what? With the vision. Let me say this to you. There's only one vision. Somebody say one vision. See how all the attention went there? I'm just a good example. That kind of stuff has to stop. Now, I'm not saying get all religious and, ooh, you're late. No. There's certain circumstance situations that happen that we got to give grace for. And I understand that. But when it's every single week, every single service, every si something's wrong. There has to be that respect and that honor to the house of God where reverence comes back to the house. In regards to the vision, there's one vision, and it's not us. It's not our vision. There's only one vision in the church. It's the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, now, there's different assignments, but there's only one vision. And I may have an assignment and a grace to operate different than Apostle does, and she may have an assignment different than mine, but we're all following the same vision, and it's the vision of the Father, hallelujah, that thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the vision, hallelujah, amen. I get tired of all these other, well, I got my vision. I said, your vision don't look like nothing like God's vision, hallelujah. That looks like a self-serving vision. Number three, for, for there to be oneness, there must be respect and honor for the leader of the house and for the people. I'll tell you, you're never going to have oneness if you don't respect the people in the house of God. God doesn't tell us just to love the leader. God says to love one another. That means... You have to love the people in the church, too. Somebody say we got to love them all. Hallelujah. Amen. Respect everybody. And the Bible tells us clearly how to respect the elderly, how to honor and respect your parents, how to honor and respect the apostle, the pastors. Hallelujah. How to honor and respect each other. Amen. Amen. And I look all the time for how respectful and how honoring people are, not just with me, because sometimes in front of me they'll, oh, you're, you're such a great man of God, and oh, we love you, and that was a great message, hallelujah, and then can't stand the sister in the church. I said, when you disrespect them, you're disrespecting me because they're part of me, hallelujah, amen. 
I, I not only teach leaders that people shouldn't be speaking evil against them, I tell leaders you shouldn't be speaking evil of your congregation either. I respect the people God brings me. I honor them. I honor their life as well. I honor what their work uh, situations are, what their financial situations are, what their family situation. So I try to honor what's in their life. And when I honor them, like let's say a brother calls and says, you know what, I couldn't make it today, and blah, 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 blah. I said, you know what, you take care of that business because that's more important right now that you do that and take care of that than being at church today hallelujah so i honor him and i respect him because that's important to his family that's important to his finances support now if he starts doing it every single week i said now something wrong but the honor and respect goes both ways it goes both ways i never used to i'll just be honest about myself First many years of my life, it was all about me. Honor me. Respect me. I'm the man of God. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm the anointed one. Everyone's supposed to respect me. And God spoke to me real loud. He says, he says do you respect them the same way you want them to respect you? Do you honor them? Do you love on them? Do you pour yourself out on them? Or there's some in there that you ain't got time for. Now, no leader could spend time with everybody. It's hard. So what we do is we grow up some people. And I tell my leaders, once I grow you up, I ain't going to be spending all my time with you. I'm going to be spending my time with the children. Because I have leaders say, you're not spending no time with me. I said, do you still need me to bottle feed you? You still need me to change your diaper? I thought those days were over. Oh, the apostle doesn't come to my house no more. No, because I'm going to the other children's house now. I went to your house. We're good. We're one. But now let me come and bring some others into maturity. Hallelujah. To be one, we need to be interdependence, not independent. Interdependence, say interdependence. Means we all depend on one another. Nobody should have their own independent spirit. Well, this is me, this is what I do, and you walk around the church like you don't care about nobody but you, but you want everybody to bow to what you do. That's an independent spirit. An independent spirit always says what they do is more important than what everybody else does. <laughs> wow, that's the quietest I've heard it so far. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Am I doing okay, Michael? Yeah. <laughs> Want to help me, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> Say interdependent. We got to be smart enough to know that we don't have it all by ourselves. I need Apostle Diana in my life. She doesn't just need me, I need her too. And as I have pioneered love and unity, I built it on that. I built it on, there's no hierarchy here. There's no one-man show here. There's no one who knows it all. We all have a measure. And my measure needs your measure. And all our measures together brings us into his measure. Hallelujah. Amen. Could I get a good amen? But I have to be interdependent. Even my sons and, and my daughters and the people in the church, I need them too. They add things to me that, that help me do what I'm able to do. And if I didn't have them, then if I was independent of them, I couldn't do what I do. So we need each other. We make each other stronger. We make each other grow. I mean, I've been around some good teachers, and they're great to be around. But they don't give us everything. 
I've been around some evangelists, and, man, they could win souls day and night, morning, noon, and they think everybody's supposed to just be winning souls all the time. I said, no, the reason why you're jacked up, tore up, and messed up because you never sat down to get any teaching. <laughs> or you never stay in a church long enough to grow up. You know what's the fastest way we grow up in a church? is not from the preaching of the pulpit. We grow in knowledge and wisdom and revelation from the pulpit. But we grow in character by our inner relationship with one another. When we can handle the person in the church that gets on our nerve the most and we can love them still, we're growing up. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you think of anybody that gets on your nerve in the church? Don't say it. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, sometimes some of the strongest the strongest leaders have the hardest time. The strongest leaders have the hardest time because they look at everybody like, what's wrong with them now? What are they doing now? Blah, blah, blah. And they look at them in that way. Did you forget that you were once there? <laughs> I was a young preacher at one time, and I did a bunch of stupid things. So when I look at young preachers now, I say, oh, God, help me to help them not do what I did. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, Help me to help them so they don't have to go through some of the sufferings I've been through. So somebody say interdependent. See, my wife always tells me that I need her. How many of you got wives that say, you need me? Well, my wife says, I'll be driving down the street. And she'll say, ah, oh, watch that car. I said, woman, I've been driving cars for years. And I've never been in an accident. I've had one ticket all my life. And every time you get in my car, you act like I don't know how to drive. And she says to me real quietly, Edward, you need me. And then I have to admit, the time she told me something, it was right. <laughs> You are fired. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> but, but let me say something to you, woman. You need a man, too. Your man's going to stop you from doing some dumb things sometimes. When you get all emotional and start talking too much. Zipit.com. I'm talking too much. Hmm. It's a teamwork. And we're interdependent upon one another. Strengths that I don't have, my wife has. Strengths that she don't have, I have. I need her, she needs me. We learn from one another, we grow from one another. Same thing with my leaders. I listen to them. Even though I'm the leader and I make the final decision, I still want to listen to them because they add wisdom to me. They add things to me that I don't see. Sometimes we have blind spots and we got to hear what they're saying. But they also know that when I make the decision, we're in witness in that decision. And we're going forward. Hello? Say interdependent. Here's another good one. Communication. Learn how to communicate to each other. Don't just hold it. I don't want to say nothing because if they say something, I'm just going to get in trouble. Well, you're going to get in trouble if you hold on to it, too. Hmm? You hold on to it long, it turns into something wrong. Hmm? You got to sit down and talk about it. And some of us don't like to talk about things because we don't like confrontation. And we don't like to discuss things. And sometimes we don't want to talk about it because we just don't want to be corrected about something. But communication is so important for a church to be in oneness, for people to be one together. You got to talk to each other. You got to communicate even things you don't want to hear, even things you don't want to receive. Sometimes my wife will say things to me that I just don't want to hear right now. And then later on, I'll go on. I said, She was right. I should have listened to that. Hmm? 
Say communication. communication. I'll ask you one question about communication. Instead of you not being happy with your leadership, how much time have you sent just to build a relationship with them? Communicating with them. Talking with them. I told Sean this week, because Sean's been in our church, I think, what, for a year and a half or so? Two years? Seven months. Seven months, okay. So he wanted to come, and I wanted him to come. And I said, I want you to come because I want to get to know you a little bit more. I mean, he's got the gift of helps on him, and of course, that's all great, but I've had helps, and I used to walk into a place, and I'd have 15 guys around me, <laughs> and they'd all be wearing suits, and a couple of them would be packing, hallelujah, amen, in case anybody wanted to touch the anointed one, hallelujah, amen. <sighs> i come in with my entourage, hallelujah, amen, and I'd be walking all cool, hallelujah, all of these guys around me look like they're a bunch of secret service guys. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I had ministry, because I taught ministry helps all over, all over the world. I taught ministry helps. I've learned ministry helps from some of the greatest ministry helps teachers. And God told me one time, he says, all that ministry helps stuff is great. But if you don't help somebody in their life, then you're not helping and your most important thing with people that are helpers is to help them. How do I help them? I spend some time with them. I listen to them. I hear what's going on in their life. I watch their weaknesses and their strengths, not to judge them, but to help grow them. And I do that. So I'll take somebody along with me. I, say, okay. I, I could take a lot of different people with me, people that I don't have to do anything with, just drive because they've already you know, leaders and doing great things. But I choose to take ones, hallelujah, that are hungry, that want to change, that want to grow, so I could just pour into them and communicate to them, hallelujah. Could I get a good amen, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We need to have things to be in unity about. So there needs to be purpose in our unity. And when people don't know the purpose they have nothing to tie themselves together to in unity. And we have to be specific with our purpose. Say specific, hallelujah. Let's say, for instance, this church is 50 people. But now you have a purpose to grow to 60 people or 70 people. I have one guy says, he's 50 people. And he says, I said, what's your purpose? What, what's your goal? Well, my next goal is to grow to 1,000 people. I said, you haven't grown to 1,000 people the past 12 years. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, makes you think you're going to get there. To, I said, let's, let's start with 10 more people. Our purpose right now is to all of us get in unity to bring 10 more new people that stay for a while. And we're gonna, how are we going to do that? And then we all tie into that purpose. What is the purpose? We're going to raise this attendance to 10 more people that are faithful, that are loyal, that are committed, that are discipled. We're going to get there, hallelujah, 10 more people. And if you did that twice a year, you'd be 20 more people every single year. But you wouldn't just have attenders. You'd have disciples. You'd have strong people. Instead of trying to reach the 1,000, hallelujah, let's reach the 11 or 12 like Jesus did at a time and focus and have purpose in those 12. And all of us gather around those 12 and build relationship with them and love on them and minister to them and talk to them, hallelujah, so that they're sound in the faith. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, boy, what we could do as churches. It's the pattern that Jesus gave us. He built his whole church. We're experiencing today on what he did with the 12. <laughs> We're still experiencing the move of God that Jesus did. And all he did is sit down with 12 of these guys that were all knuckleheads, by the way. And he sat down with them and he imparted his father's heart. He imparted love to them. He imparted discipleship to them. He trained them and got around them. Hallelujah. And those end up being the apostles of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Peter being one of the greatest ones out of them 
and he gave Jesus the hardest time that Jesus never gave. I mean, can you imagine a leader come and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Uh, I've wanted to say that a few times, hallelujah, amen. Uh, I said, get thee behind me, devil. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. But yet he says about Peter, Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, hallelujah, but my Father which is in heaven, hallelujah. This day you're no longer Peter, this day, hallelujah, nor Simon, you're now Peter the rock, hallelujah. And upon this church, this rock, I will build my church, hallelujah, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What did he do? He imparted to Peter until Peter got revelation of who they are. So we have to have purposes for people to get in unity about. Amen. I did that with love and unity. I First God told me to build the senior council. We built the senior council, and then we first all got in unity on building the Zooms. And as we got in, in unity about building the Zooms, now we have Zooms all over the nation. Then we got into unity about convergences. And now we're having convergences all over the nation. Then we got a new unity about building the, key, the TV, and now we're reaching 10 million viewers a year. Then we got into unity about building together churches that will come together so we can set up regional churches all over the nation. And now we come into unity with that. And everything we come into unity with, God's hand is upon it with anointing. <sighs> And it comes with the provision, it comes with the strength, it comes with the wisdom. We don't have to work hard at it. We rest when we are in unity. You only work hard when there is no unity. If you're a husband and wife trying to fulfill purposes but there's no unity, it's going to be hard, hard, hard. But if you come into unity, guess what? God does it. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, he advances it. And the other thing God taught me is you don't have to get in unity with everybody in the church because everybody's not going to be in unity with you. But your key leaders have to be in unity. Because some are still learning and growing. Some won't catch what you're saying until a year down the road. But the leadership must be in unity. And here's a good one. If we're going to be in oneness, we must be people of humility. Oh, one of the things that I have a hard time with is pride. Know-it-alls. They're always trying to help everybody because they know everything. Oh. I don't look on how much somebody knows. I look on how humble someone is. I've known some people, man, they know some stuff. They could go deep in Revelation. They could go deep in Greek and Hebrew. They could go deep in the Word of God and history and everything else. And they are as arrogant as could be. Going deep don't make you deep. Because I know a lot of deep people that are shallow. Shallow in love. Shallow in character. They have no relationships with people. They can't get along with nobody because they're full of head knowledge. And the Bible says knowledge puffeth up. Puffs you up. I'm not against Greek, Hebrew. I like all that stuff. But that's not my focus. I have degrees too and I can shine them on. All the time. I've had every kind of license you could possibly think of. And when I was growing up, they told me I'd be the stupidest one out of everybody because I, I couldn't learn for nothing. I asked God, I said, God, how come you didn't make me smart when I first started out? He goes, because if you would have been smart, you wouldn't have listened to anything I had to say. He says, but you come to me like a foolish one. And I take the foolish ones to confound the wise. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm so glad. Hallelujah. Amen. And, and don't get me wrong. I'm not against people that, that uh, love knowledge and love to learn and love to do all that stuff. 
they have their part. But when you put that above being humble and having character, it doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. You can reach more people with humility than you can with how much you know. Wait, 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 wait. Let's just say that one more time. Hallelujah. I said you can reach more people with humility than, than how much you think you know. <laughs> just smile somebody. Say, I hope he ain't talking about you. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I know some people that follow every speaker on, on Facebook, every speaker on YouTube, every speaker. They're trying to get all this revelation from all these men and women of God, and you can't even submit to one. You're getting so much knowledge out there, you're confused. Because you're trying to Get everyone to like you. Listening to everybody and their mother. And you can't even listen at church on Sunday. <sighs> Let me tell you why your first place to learn from is the house of God. is because that's where God joined you to. And where God joined you to is where the greatest anointing is to set you free. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, you could go and listen to all kinds of people that may have greater revelation, but do they have the anointing for your life? Hallelujah. Amen. Because the ones that have the anointing for your life is the one that God has chosen for you to join with. Hallelujah. And be fitly joined together. Glory to God. And once you receive that, which you're supposed to be joined together, that's when you're going to grow the most. Hallelujah. Amen. Is you got to be joined together. I would do anything to be where I'm supposed to be, not where I want to be. Because if you're with where you're supposed to be, you're in the will of God. And when you're in the will of God, that's where you grow, change, transform the most. Hallelujah. Amen. We never let finances. We never let uh, uh, positions. We never let work. We never let anything determine where we're supposed to be. We find out, God, where do you want me to be? Because I want to be in the perfect will of God. Why? Because when you're in the will of God, you're moving by the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom is doing the will of God. Hallelujah. Number nine, there must be grace for everyone. We got to give people grace. We just had a, a new grandbaby called Grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Grace. Somebody say grace. Let me tell you what it means to give grace. Let's say Michael's coming to church and he's doing all right, but he's making mistakes. Saying things he shouldn't be saying, doing things he shouldn't be doing. If I give him grace, I'm going to help him. But if I give him judgment, he will shut off from me. So I don't look at the mistakes. What I look at is where I'm trying to take him. That's giving grace to somebody. I don't look at what's wrong with somebody. I look at where we're taking somebody. And it takes grace to get us there. It takes his grace. Somebody say grace. Somebody say, I love grace. Hallelujah. Amen. If it wasn't for grace, where would you be? Hallelujah. Imagine if God would have gave up on you the way you gave up on others. Hallelujah. God never gave up on you. God never gave up on me. His grace is sufficient. Hallelujah. Even when I wasn't even gracious with myself, God was gracious with me. Hallelujah. And sometimes we just got to give each other some grace. I'll tell you one group of people that we really need to give grace to, and that's our kids. And we look at our kids like, you're not supposed to be living that way. You're not supposed to be talking that way. You're not supposed to be doing this. And we beat them up. Let's say they're sleeping like this guy in the front here. 
give him grace. He's tired, hallelujah, amen. Uh, he's a young man, hallelujah. You had your sleeping days too, hallelujah, amen. Uh, but guess what? He's in the house, hallelujah, amen. Uh, don't get, oh, he should not be sleeping. Oh, my gosh, I can't believe he's sleeping in the front row. <laughs> but he's here. We have some, some new young kids that are coming to our church, and they're wild. And, and what I love is that the whole church has surrounded these kids with love. They be under the chairs. They be running while I be preaching. Hallelujah. Amen. The mom be chasing them. Hallelujah. They'll come in and bring stuff and drip it on my carpet. And before I be mad, I said, mm, somebody better straighten those kids up real quick. <laughs> but we love on them. And we hug them. My wife the other day with one of the young boys, uh, she was giving out snacks to some of the kids that were there because she likes to be around all the kids when they're eating and just talking and stuff. So she goes with the kids, and all our grandkids are right there. So she's hugging on our grandkids, say, I love you, I love you. And they say, I love you, Nana, because they call her, I love you, Nana, I love you, Nana. And this little boy standing there looking at her. And she, and she looks at him. She says, you okay? He says, could I have one of those hugs? <laughs> That's what she did. <laughs> she started bawling her head off. <laughs> and she got him and hugged him and said, I love you too. Doesn't have no grandmas. Doesn't have that. Never grew up with that. And all that little boy needed is a little bit of love, a little bit of grace. Are you still here with me? If we want our kids to stay in church, we better give them some grace. Mm -hmm. They're going to have moments, just like we all had moments. When my mom first took me to church, I think I was 15 years old because we were raised Catholics. I, I made my first communion, my confirmation, because I used to like to drink in the back with the priest. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh. <laughs> That's the truth, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> and I go do all this stuff, and then I didn't like the nuns, though. The nuns used to hit me in the hand with the ruler all the time. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to take that thing and whack you with it, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> then my mom took me to the Pentecostal church. My mom got saved. And the reason why my mom went to church was because my aunt said, you need to get to church and get saved because you keep crying and complaining about Eddie, but if you don't get your life right, he ain't never going to change. You need to come to church. So my aunt invited her to church and Pentecostal to the bone. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, I mean, full-blown chandelier kind of Pentecostal. Hallelujah. Amen. Where people, I mean, they're, they're, they're shouting, they're screaming, they're hollering. Hallelujah. And my mom goes to this church and she gets saved and she gets full of the Holy Ghost the first day, her and my sister. She comes home and says, you're going to church. <laughs> I said, oh, no, here we go. And I hear her in the room speaking in tongues. I said, this woman has drank one Coors Light too many. Hallelujah, amen. Uh, she had one depression pill too many. She's gone with some crazy people now. Uh, and I said, I ain't going to church. She goes, oh, yes, you are. I said, no, I'm not. And I ran away. So I ain't going to church. And then one day she said, you need to come back. You need to go to church. And then my stepdad says, if you go to church, I'll help you buy your first car. I said, all right. Now we're talking. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, now we're talking. Hallelujah. Amen. You'll get me my first car. with your first car. I said, oh, boy. That, let's go. Hallelujah. I'll go to church. Where are we going? So I went to church. And I went like a gangster. I had my Pendleton on. My, I had a net on my head. Hallelujah. I had a big old handkerchief hanging out of my back pocket. And I walked into that church dogging everybody, just looking at everybody. 
And they're all looking at me. I'm looking at them. They're looking at me. Hallelujah. And they're saying, whose kid is this? And while the service was going on, I stood in the back of the church with my foot up against the wall, leaning against the wall, and all I was doing was checking out the girls. <laughs> so, ooh, Lord, there's a few good-looking ones in here. Hallelujah. Maybe I could come back one more time. Hallelujah. Amen. My motive was wrong. My heart was wrong. My behavior was wrong. Everything was wrong. And they treated me bad. Not one of them came to talk to me. Not one of them came and said, are you all right, son? Can we pray for you? Except for one guy. And this guy came up to me. His name was Richard. And he says, look at, here's my name and here's my phone number. If you ever get to the place where you want help, you call me and I'll be there to help you. Everybody else in there completely ignored me. Because they saw me for what I was. They didn't give me no grace. Sometimes people will come into our church. They're all jacked up, messed up, tore up. And you know what's going to keep them here? Is the decision whether or not you treated them with religion or you treated them with grace. Hallelujah. Amen. And you must treat them with grace. You must lo stop looking at their clothing and their hair and the way they're acting. Hallelujah. What did you look like when you first came into the church? Hallelujah. Amen. You were all jacked up too. And guess what? When I turned 18, I was all messed up on drugs. My mind was gone, fried. They picked me up one night. I was trying to kill myself. And the cops got me and took me to an insane place, put me in a straight jacket, tied me down to a bed, and said, this kid's never going to be the same again. His brain's already a vegetable. He's gone. I couldn't talk. But God supernaturally came and visited me in that room and instantly delivered me. Hallelujah. Amen. And I got up and all I said was, I want Jesus. I need Jesus. And Jesus came into my life. The doctors walked in and said, this is not the same guy. He's different. They took the straight jacket off and I took off running out of the hospital. And I pulled that number I've been saving all this time out of my pocket, and I called Richard. I said, Richard, this is Eddie, and you said if I'll ever call you that you'll come and get me. Will you come and get me? He came and got me, took me to his house, and him and I sat down and kneeled at the side of his couch, and I gave my life to Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> Why? Because he didn't judge me. He didn't condemn me. And guess what else? He kept his word. Hallelujah. Amen. And he helped me and gave me a love that I've never experienced in my life. Uh, mm -hmm. and then he would sit with me. Back then, we used to study the Dake Bible. Remember the Dake Bible? Big old thing, thing like that. Hallelujah. Amen. And he would teach me scripture after scripture, and we'd sit down there on that table and just learn the word of God together. And six months later, I was in Bible school. But what if he wouldn't have showed me grace? We got to show our kids grace, even when they're in trouble, even when they're all jacked up, talking ugly, acting ugly. Don't ever give up the grace on their life. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go to the next one. Next one is there must be a people of submission. We have to have a submitted heart. If you go to church and you don't have a submitted heart because of all that you experienced in the last church, and now you're in this church and you're just thinking whether or not you're going to submit, don't go to a church unless you're ready to submit and be accountable. You've got to have a submissive heart. Not to be controlled, not to be ruled over, but submission in heart that means you're ready to align with the church. You're ready to align with the leader. You're ready to respect and honor those that are in the house of God. And when you do that, it'll help you receive everything you were meant to go there for. Listen to me. God doesn't bring you to a church or to a house because there's not another house around. Because there's plenty of them. 
Yeah, you could go to any church you want to. You go to the big ones, little ones, crazy ones, dumb ones, hallelujah, wild ones. You, there's all kinds of them. Po- apostolic churches, legalistic churches, self-righteous churches, kingdom churches. They're all out there. What you got to do is go where God wants you to go. <laughs> And you don't leave until God releases you to leave. Uh, You don't leave because somebody made you mad. You don't leave because the pastor hurt your feelings. You don't leave because a message was preached and you think they were just picking on you. Hallelujah. You don't leave because you didn't get the position you wanted. Hallelujah. Amen. You don't leave because sister so-and-so's got a problem with you. Hallelujah. Amen. You don't leave until God says to leave. Hallelujah. Amen. And you leave with a blessing. Hallelujah. Amen. You never just went. You were always sent. When some people come and ask me to leave the church before, I would say, no, you ain't leaving nowhere. Well, I feel God's telling me to leave. No. Nope. God called you here. You've got to stay here forever. And God woke me up one time. He says, what if I want them to leave? I said, mm, never thought about that before. Hallelujah. What if it's time for them to go help somebody else? And you were only to put a certain part into their life, and now they need to go somewhere else and get the other part. We become owners sometimes of the congregational members and sometimes don't release them. And when you hold somebody longer than their time, they're the ones that cause the problems. Because they're frustrated. Because they're not flowing where they're supposed to flow because they're not where they're supposed to be. I'd rather have somebody say, hey, God called you to go somewhere. I always ask him, where is he calling you to go? Because God never takes you out of somewhere unless he's already told you where he wants you to go. And what he wants you to do. What's God telling you to do? I said, okay, praise God. Because as a father, all I want you to do is to get everything God has for your life. And be everything, whether it's here or somewhere else, I don't care. I just want you to have it. And I always want you to know that this house and this church is always here for you, even if you go somewhere else. We're going to love you no matter what. Now, come up and let us bless you out. That you go with the blessing, not with the rebellion. Ain't nobody here today, Apostle Diane. Hallelujah. You hear anybody here today? Could I get at least an amen? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We have too many of those. What, what, what do they call those people that go from place to place to place to place? Church well, church hoppers, but no, vagabonds. Whoa, you guys come up with a lot of them. Hallelujah. Amen. Those vagabonds. Hallelujah. Church hoppers. Hallelujah. <laughs> no, those type of people that are always in the old movies, they'd always be going from one place to the next place. Gypsies, Yeah. We got some gypsies in the church, hallelujah, amen. They just load up and go from one place to the next place, hallelujah. And as soon as they don't find something they like there, they go on to the next one, hallelujah. And as soon as somebody makes a map there, they go on to the next one. Did you know every church you left, it wasn't because of what the church wasn't, it was because of what you weren't, hallelujah, amen. And if you don't fix what needs to be fixed, you're going to have the same problem at the next place. Something needs to be fixed. So there must be submission. Some say submission. And there must be, here's a good one, forgiveness. Listen to me. When you're in church every single week, two, three days a week, fellowships with one another, You're going to have moments where you offend one another. But if you walk in the spirit of forgiveness, you let the offenses roll off. Hallelujah. Amen. 
and you walk in the spirit of forgiveness. The church is supposed to live forgiveness every single day. If you don't live forgiveness, then you live offended. And I'll be honest with you, she's going to make you mad sometimes. I know I make my people mad all the time. Hallelujah. Amen. And, I, and, they, and I'll look at them sometimes. I said, you're upset with me, huh? No, no, I'm not upset with you. I said, I could tell. <laughs> it's okay to be upset with me. That doesn't make you a bad person. doesn't make you a bad person. But let's sit down and talk because I don't want you carrying around that offense because it's going to grow into something else. So let's, let's, let's sit down and have a talk. Hmm? What did I say? What did I do? Because sometimes I say things that I didn't even know I said that. Hmm. Or sometimes I'll make a commitment to somebody in a service like this, and I forget. And they go say, you're not a man of your word. You made a commitment to me, and you didn't stick to it. I said, I did? When did I do that? When I was walking out the door with 50 other people. And you're shaking hands with everybody and talking to everybody, and you wanted me to stop and remember that one thing. Come on, give me some grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh. The one of the biggest things I've got in trouble in, hallelujah, is preaching a message, and some of you say, you were just talking to me. You were pointing out to me. I said, I was? You were talking to me? I said, then I must have been. Because I only preach what the Holy Ghost tells me to preach. So the Holy Ghost must have been wanting to talk to you. <laughs> Just smile at somebody next to you and say, now I know he's talking about you. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There be sometimes... Uh, my spiritual father was Dr. Bob Lemon and his wife, Mary Bell. She was a trip. Hallelujah. Amen. This woman was a trip. She didn't hold nothing back. She offended me a million times. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, at least a million times. One time we're in the middle of a service and he's preaching. Her husband's up there preaching, giving a word. And she looked over to me and she says, you know what's wrong with you, Eddie? I'm in the middle of a conference. He says, you got a big head. I said, right now? Right now you're going to tell me this in the middle of a service? I'm trying to receive from the man of God, and you're telling me i got a big head. She says, you not only have a big head, you have a bigger head than everybody else. I said, this woman, that's it. I'm done. I said, let's you and I go in the back. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, we're going to go toe to toe. But I left that service and I was bothered. I was offended. Not just because she told me that, because when she told me and how she told me. I was offended. So for a while, I couldn't even receive from them. I closed my heart off. I said, I ain't dealing with this no more. That's not a leader. That's not a mature person. They don't do stuff like that. And God says, how many times do you think you said something off the cuff that hurt somebody or offended somebody? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know, God, probably a few times. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he says, you need to forgive her. She says, yes, what she did was wrong, but you need to forgive her. So I called her up, Mary Bell. She goes, hi, Eddie, it's about time you call it. You still mad at me? She knew I was mad at her, hallelujah, amen. <laughs> That's the way she was. She was just straight out in blood. And I said, yeah, I want to ask you to forgive me because you made me mad. And I was upset. You're my spiritual mother, and I don't like the way you talk to me. And she said, Eddie, I'm glad you got over it. That's what she tells me. I'm glad. If you thought Dr. Baker was bold, this lady was bolder, hallelujah, amen. Um, I'm glad you got over it, but I'm sorry also because I feel bad by the way I talk to you as well. And then we hugged and moved on. 
and I tell my spiritual, I said, how do you deal with that all the time? Hallelujah. He tells me, because one time they're on the front row, and he's up there preaching about how a home should run and how a man should treat his wife. And she said real loud in front of a thousand people, Bob, why are you preaching that? You never do that at home. Uh. What about Bob? Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> or Bob, hallelujah. <laughs> you know, some ladies can be pretty bold. And the Bob says, Bob's so used to handling her, he knows how to handle her right. He goes, Now, Mary Bell, you're out of order. <laughs> And he says, ushers, take her out. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, and they took her out. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> thousand people on the, everybody just started busting up. But you know what it did when she did that? It broke out a move of God in that service, Ellie, because everybody started laughing, getting drunk in the Holy Ghost. People were laying all over the place from that one thing. Now, Mary Bell. You're out of water. <laughs> Take her out. <laughs> Amen. But there's always an opportunity to be bitter, to be offended, to be hurt, because we spend a lot of time with each other. You mean you could go around your family and they never bother you? You still love them. You have to learn to forgive them if you're going to live in the same house together. Be in the same family. You got to learn to forgive. Well, same thing in the house of God. You got to learn to forgive each other. We're going to offend each other from time to time. We're going to be short on our grace from time to time. We're going to say things sometimes we shouldn't say. We're going to behave in ways we shouldn't behave. But guess what? We are people of forgiveness. Hallelujah. Amen. We learn to forgive one another. Hallelujah. Look at somebody and say, I forgive you now. Hallelujah. Amen. And I just want to close with one passage of Scripture, and we'll close with this. Look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12, and it's about being one body, many members, but one body. For as the body is one, the body is what? Speaking of the body of Christ, we should be what? One. And we have many what? And all members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're many, many members, but we're supposed to be one. Now, this body has different members in it. My physical body has different members, but it's all together as one. You can't separate the members. We can't be, we got four members together over here and three members together over there. We build our little cliques. Two members over here, three members over here, and we got a bunch of little different bodies all over the place severed. You got arms over there and legs over there, hallelujah, heads over there, ears over there, eyes over there, and they all looking at each other strange. Amen. Did you know if you're an eye? You should be so happy that there's a few years around here. Because if you had a body with no ears and just eyes, you could hear nothing. But if you were a year and you had no eyes, you couldn't see nothing. So the eye needs the ears, and the ears need the eyes, and we all need to come together as one and stop looking at each other like we're supposed to be exactly like one another because we're not exactly like one another. But I need what you have, and you need what I have. Hallelujah. And together we make one body. Hallelujah. For by one spirit are all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, we have been made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, it is therefore not of the body. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not an eye, am I not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? 
If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? But now God has set members, hallelujah, and every one of them in the body has it pleased him, hallelujah, amen. Guess what? You're here, let's say you're an eye, but you're here with years, you're here with arms, you're here with legs, you're here with freeze, and guess what? It pleased the Father to put you here with the other ones that don't look like you, hallelujah, amen. Man. Could you imagine if we came in here and we all looked like one big ear? <laughs> but God brings into a church as it pleased him. He brings in a few ears. He brings in a few eyes. He brings in a few arms. He brings in a few legs. He brings in a few things. And before you know it, he forms one body out of many members hallelujah amen and when you become one look out devil hallelujah amen. when you become one the anointing starts to flow and there's where god commands his blessings hallelujah amen where where the people are one that's where the blessings come from but if we are divided unforgiving backbiting hating holding grudges offended we are robbing our lives our families from their blessings hallelujah i don't know about you but i'm ready to be blessed coming in and blessed going out the head and not the tail and the way i'm gonna do that is i gotta love the body of christ hallelujah amen and come together as one uh, corporate body We must become one. And let's go to verse 26 and rather, or verse 25. And there should be no schisms in the body. Say no schisms. What is a schism? Strife, division, discord. But what the members should have, the same care for one another. The same care. Whether one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Hallelujah. Say rejoice. rejoice. So if Apostle Diane sees somebody, you know, coming up and learning and growing and helping and serving, and she says, well, I'm going to bring that sister up, and I'm going to give her now a position. Everybody should rejoice. I say, hmm, she must know things. She doesn't know what I know about her. Hallelujah. And if I was her, I wouldn't be putting her up there. Huh. The Bible didn't tell you to judge whether or not she's the right one or the wrong one. The Bible told you to rejoice, hallelujah, amen. I said the Bible told you to rejoice, hallelujah, amen. So when one gets promoted, we all what? If one is suffering, we all? That's how the body works. We work as one body of believer. When one hurts, we're all hurting. When one is blessed, we're all blessed, hallelujah. Why? Because you see the year, even though you're the eye, as part of the body, so when the year gets blessed, so do you. Because you belong to the whole body. Are you here with me? How many glad when your brother or sister is blessed? There was a time when, when the prosperity message was being taught. Everybody was competing with what kind of cars they drove up with. That was back in the town car days and the Cadillac days. And, 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 if you, and if you got a new town car, you're moving on up. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, <laughs> uh -uh. So even the, the preachers that didn't have no money at all, and they, and they lived in a one-bedroom apartment with ten kids, they drive up with a brand-new town car. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, Yeah, 
I said, man, instead of getting in one bed, you ought to sleep everybody in your car. Hallelujah. Amen. The car is bigger than your apartment. <laughs> but everybody was showing off. And people started arguing and fighting in the parking lot over it. Jealous of each other, comparing. I saw one guy one time get the town car and purposely parked it over towards somebody he doesn't like who's driving a 64 Impala. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, said, God must be blessing me more than he look at you. You're still driving that raggedy old thing. You learn listen to me because look what God's given me. I said, yeah, but you didn't tell him that you broke and your credit's all messed up. Hallelujah. And somebody helped you get that car. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh. <laughs> How did I get here, Michael? Hallelujah. Amen. We're supposed to be happy when each other is blessed. When somebody drives up with a new car, everybody should go out and lay hands on it. Bless it, anoint it, and be happy for one another. Could I get a good amen, hallelujah? If somebody gets a job promotion, tell that sister, that brother, praise the Lord, hallelujah. Because when you get promoted, the body of Christ gets promoted, hallelujah, amen. We all get promoted because we are many members but one body. No schisms. Romans 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Verse 18 says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. These are things that should not be because it hurts the whole body when there's schism in the church. Could I get a good amen? Yeah. So today, I'm declaring the spirit of oneness in this church. Hallelujah. Yeah. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I tear down schisms, division, strife, discord, hurts, wounds, offenses, unforgiveness, hallelujah. Get out of here in the name of Jesus. And I release the spirit of oneness in this place, the spirit of love in this place, the spirit of agreement in this place, the spirit of submission to this place. Let the glory of the Lord fill this house, hallelujah, that there be no... Let's stand to our feet, hallelujah.
ready, amen, are ready to move forward. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. That's why I have the leadership uh, meeting once a month where we just come and lay it all on the table and meet and fellowship. And uh, uh, next Saturday we'll be um, having another uh, leadership uh, meeting, and we're just going to dialogue on everything that was taught. Let's do that. Everything that was taught and uh, just come together. It was just so, so awesome. It's so awesome.